today, actually, I'll be talking about what's near and dear to my heart, where I've been spending almost half of my life, 25 years in technology commercialization. And hopefully, by telling you a little bit about my story, you get a little bit inspired and see that it's all about creating value. So that's why the title, I didn't get to change it anymore, uh, in the sense that uh, it's all about being able to move your technology to the point where the value is created. Just like everyone, I'd like to establish my credential as a researcher first, so that at least you'll believe half of what I'm going to say afterwards. <laughs> Actually, I did get started in research after leaving, uh, finishing my undergrad here, and I went in biotechnology for the first few years. In 1989 to 93, I worked for a company in Boston, and then moving onwards, after coming back here for a, a short break in 1993, where I got acquainted with the technology, I started on that research as well, and moved that from the bench, being on my PhD thesis, all the way to a commercial company. And going from a development time of about 17 years, again, as I mentioned, I was a Balik scientist in 2013, after having sold my company in 2012 to Johnson & Johnson. And, uh, of course, I've been always an advocate of technology commercialization and intellectual property. So, hopefully, you'll believe of half what I'm going to say after this, right? Just hoping. <laughs> okay, from a research area, I've always liked to impart to the group that before you actually start the commercialization uh, cycle, you're normally involved with a lot of different things. And just like what Dr. Delis uh, said earlier, humanities, other areas of studies actually fill you up to the point where, at the point that you're ready to go to the next step, it helps. So uh, uh, definitely the humanities. I was sorry I'm not a UP uh, graduate. I went to uh, uh, Philippine Science, where Portia over there is my classmate in Batch 83. But I went to Baguio, a university, a uh, Catholic university in Baguio called St. Louis. And people ask me in grad school, actually, in 1989, ah, what's the most important engineering course that you've taken? And I said, it's religion. Why? Because I end up talking to my fellow grad students in Rensselaer, from India, from Korea, from Japan, about the religion as an icebreaker. That's where the humanities, the soft touch, came in. To just break the ice, I said, I know about Shinto, I know about Buddhism, and really, this has nothing to do with engineering. So, but that's the value of humanity. So I really affirm your, your earlier talk, Dr. Delisa. Thanks. But going into deep science now, as I uh, got involved in medical product development after my research. So you'll never know where you'll end up. Uh, as a, again, I deal with doctors on a daily basis during my company. So uh, dealing with UP Manila at this point is like par for the course. I tried to avoid when I came back here to, de to go back to healthcare. But I got, I got invited into uh, the Global Health Forum and actually in the NIH, Dr. Eva uh, invited me as well. This is actually my third engagement in UP this year. I was in biotech in Los Baños and tried to look for... Uh, the, there, there they are. <laughs> Hello. So you, some of these slides may be familiar, so bear with me, but I have a surprise slide at the end for you. So with that background, as you can see, I, on, I only post this so that people will get acquainted that technology commercialization takes a while. It's almost like raising a kid. So my career actually spanned about 25 years now. And I'm still at it, actually. I'm still excited. I'm still uh, moving forward. May the, te the technologies may have changed. But it's that kind of a dedication, almost like a vocation, <laughs> if you want to call it that way. But clearly, I went through several cycles. And what I want to relate is every step of the way, there's value creation. And that's how you kind of chain of events that happen in your life as a researcher. So how did I get it started? I was deep in research. I was doing my PhD in chemical engineering. And I got started into it by simply doing one thing. I filed a patent. I discovered that the way to make my material, normally they say you can't, once you've inoculated it, I'm a biochemical engineer, so uh, it's like a fermentation process. Once you inoculate it, don't touch it. And I said, what if, instead of 
not touching it, I rotate it into the media and it created a new process of making a material. And they said, how do you do that? And that's how I got started. I, I ended up filing a patent. And this was actually during my break when I was involved. How many of you are still remember the 1993 boom of Nata de Coco? But, so I'm in kindred spirits here. So I was there. I was here, actually. I remember Willie Padolina, who was the OSD secretary at that point, talking about how we can make it sustainable at that time. There was a boom. Uh, Japan ex imported $28 million worth of nata de coco. They had a craze, a uh, health craze about eating it. Same way they had a craze on mascarpone and cheese from Italy. They bought the whole years in their house of gloves. So the same thing happened. And Dr. Padolina said the way to make it sustainable at that point was we have to develop applications. We have to be able to know. So why don't we license the patents of the applications and then do an honest to goodness development of product. So when I saw him when I came back here in 2013, you we were a little bit involved with the Picari uh, startup at that point in time. I told him, hi, Dr. Patalunia, I did follow exactly what you did and I spent 17 years trying to commercialize the technology. So that's how it all got started by filing a patent and presenting my patent in one of these booths where an alumni of the university who just sold his diaper business approached me and he saw that material, this material, which is to a lot of people very familiar, that's not a decoco in a very thick state, <laughs> but it's not much different from what we actually eat in our halo halo. So he saw one of these and then that's what we got started talking in 1995 and end up starting a company a year later. And that's the birth of silos, the one on the corner. And it's all about a technology called microbial cellulose. It's a cellulosic material, not much different from the table and the, the cloth that you're wearing. It's cotton, except it's about 100 times finer than cotton and it absorbs about 100 times its weight. So for a normally uh, un and characteristic layman, they said, oh, can I use it as a diaper, a uh, super absorbent. But we ended up developing a different. But as a researcher, I had to be able to shift in terms of technical. So being a researcher in the university is different when you already have a company where you have to sink and swim, you have to raise money, you have to find your Counterparts. That's why I'm encouraging people here. To, I'm daring them actually to jump. Because just like anything else, I always tell people, you can read all the books about farming, but until you take dirt, you're not a farmer. So the same thing with entrepreneurship and technology. You can dabble and you can try to do it as a professor and do a little bit of commercialization here and there. But to me, the best way is to jump in and swim. That's what my daughter just did two weeks ago. <laughs> so with that kind of thing, you have to know exactly where you're jumping into. And this, I just want to illustrate that in my case, I had to shift completely from research to more of what I need, even being able to learn how to conduct clinical trials <laughs> and dealing with the regulatory agencies like the FDA because my product was an FDA-regulated product. So those are the skill sets, but one good thing about it is being an entrepreneur, I can tell you, for the last 17 years, I always have a different problem every month. <laughs> so never the same. So I'm always either worried about the patient, worried about the sales, or worried about raising venture capital. But it's a constant grind, but it is very enriching. So I dare you guys to do it. <laughs> but at the same time, I, there are startup challenges which we're going through right now here in UP. And we just went through one, I'm happy to say that we've gone through, a, we're able to birth, give birth to one that went through our Fairness Opinion Report and been signed by the, that is the Dengiket, the m -tech, uh, technology. And I'm hoping that within the next couple of years, that now that the runway is open, that we'll have more spin-offs coming out. Another area is on being able to complete your team. I'm telling people, just like a, an entrepreneurial company, I'm encouraging all the CEUs actually of UP to form their IP and technology commercialization team. That way they can deal with the upcoming surge in intellectual property and commercialization activity that we're trying to uh, promote from the system level. 
with Louis Season. So, clearly, I just want to have, uh, uh, for you guys to have a flavor, what it takes. And also, be careful. A lot of people ask me, Al, what about money? Where do we get the money? Money is always the problem, they always said. It's not. Actually, if you have a very good idea and a, a clear view on where you want to take your technology, money comes naturally. There's enough money, in, even in the Philippines. I've been consulted by people in the business sector, which I'm very intimately acquainted with, and are asking me, Al, where's the technologies that you're supposed to line up for us? This is what CC was asking me every year, every time we see each other for dinner. And I said, it's not yet ready, because I'm not going to put my name on it until it's good and ready. And unfortunately, when Dr. Benny Pacheco invited me to do a colloquium early 2013 and looked at the UP technologies and patent holders, including Dr. Henry Ramos, Dr. Patasanza, and a host of other patents, I tried, in my earnest, to push them forward towards commercialization. Unfortunately, at that point in time, it was not yet ready, and there were additional activities that need to be done. I think Professor Ramos was able to get his technology out on license, but it still hasn't gone through that fifth year cycle that would make it sustainable. So we're still going through the challenges. So as you can see, it does take time. But in the event that you do get money, be careful what you wish for. Because the people that fund startups, they'll ask, not your firstborn at least, they'll ask for milestones. And this is the kind of milestone activity that we're also implementing in our grant making in USAID Stride, which I'm also a consultant. We typically, I think Dr. Carla knows that because I'm handling her, her development research for Stride. We establish milestones before even starting with a project. And then we monitor the milestones the same way a VC giving you money. This is, the, this is actually my first $1 million funding in 1998 when I got it. And these are the marching orders. Very specific. So, but it also makes you very focused in that whatever you want to achieve, it's already listed because they already know. And that's this is exactly what we're trying to do with some, some of the technologies that we have here. And I'm hoping that by the time we're done combing over the patent filings, the disclosures to the patent filings, to the commercialization strategy in UP, we would have exact milestones ready for venture capital funding. And I hope that Chancellor Menchi in, in, I mean in, in Manila would have three. Definitely from Los Baños, I'm expecting more, five, with all the technologies that are there, already even have FPA applications uh, cleared already. In UP Diliman, I'm also hoping that we have at least three, three to five as well. So by the time we all combined it, the whole, including Visayas, would have a share of, at least if we can achieve 20. Uh, 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 commercialization efforts in earnest uh, will probably at least have a real, real caseload. Because I'm trying to, I just visited the Rutgers University with Louis in May last year, and we spoke to uh, Mark Robson and their technology center. They file about 215 patents a year, and they have about 110 licensing agreements moving forward. So we, this is one, one little university in New Jersey, and our metrics are way small compared to that. But I think we'll get there. I think we'll achieve 100 disclosures and at least maybe 20, 25 patents filed this year. And we're going to scale up. And I think VC Rex over there is nodding his head. I hope uh, we can do that with uh, Rick also for Visayas. So moving forward on that one, this is the kind of thing that you have to adapt. Not everyone's geared up for, for being able to commercialize the technology. But I always encourage the young researchers, the guys in the back, the young, re the young inventors. Usually it's not the, the national scientists like Dr. Trono over here that tend to do it in their mid-career. Now he's doing it in his after uh, emeritus career. But normally it's the young ones that have the energy and the risk-taking ability. So I do encourage you because it does require you to have a host of skill sets that are quite different from being a research scientist. But if you, if, uh, if you really wanted to do it, I think you'll pick it up much easier in terms of being able to do all of these things. But you have to follow it from each, from pitching, what do you have, what's your elevator pitch. We always have this rehearsal that 
if you happen to meet Bill Gates on the elevator and he asks you, Hi Al, what do you do? Ah, I develop medical devices. I actually build body parts to replace breaking parts in the human body. Oh really? How do you do that? Ah, I use this different material that's not been used before for these applications and we can replace human body parts as well as animal body parts that you typically use. Okay, talk to me later. So you should be able to concisely pitch every single time that you're available or every chance you get. You see President Pascual walking there or Giselle Concepcion. I need an e you need money? How about an EIDR? Okay, then tell me what's your EIDR. I'm able to digest data from the big, big data from DEX, from the Department of Education, to be able to direct them where to put their supplies and their evacuation centers. Maybe a simple elevator pitch like that would be I mean, handy, you'll never know. So always prepare. Always prepare, know your technology and what is your elevator pitch. And then going to that, being able to uh, tell them, why should I be interested? What's, what's the competitive edge? As well as going all the way down to the clinical. This is where it gets bloody. When you have to really prove what your proof of concept is. And that's what I'll stress to everyone. Because when I came here, I also was a Balik scientist and I looked at that portfolio of DOST. And if there's anything, and Dr. Nuna was the EITDI uh, head at that time, if there's anything that was very challenging for us at DOST was being able to articulate the value proposition of all the technologies we funded. That was the biggest challenge. We have a filter, we have a dengue, uh, ovuli lab result kit, and yet we can't say that connect that technology to how many lives did we save yesterday or today. And that's the kind of technology that I wanted Porsche and Eloy from UP Manila on the RX boxes to be able to vocalize. We now have 1,000 RX boxes and it will save thousands of lives every month if these are properly put in the hands of the clinicians out there in the rural areas. That's the kind of pitch that we need to be able to tell the DOA secretary, the president, the senators. So, clearly, just, being a, just because you're a researcher doesn't mean you can't pitch. You have to learn how to be able to tell them exactly what you're all about. So with that, I think, just to give you time perspective, I usually use a metric. I just uh, hosted the uh, pres former president of the AUTM. This is the Association of University technology managers in the United States. His name is John Prasher. He was here in September and I took them to meet the system people. This last week I made them meet the Diliman and UP Manila group. And he always, in that talk of his, he always mentioned that even the most advanced technology manager universities in the United States, like Colombia, it does take time. Uh, there was a, a video clip that he showed before the three by seven, it says that from the time that we filed our first patent, it takes us about three years before one third of that group of patents that we filed gets noticed for licensing. And only about 70% of them gets licensed in seven years. License pala yan, not And remember, the, the real product development only starts at the beginning of the licensing. Wala pong producto yun. So imagine how long it will take to develop a product. So, so I'm take, talking about like raising a kid almost. <laughs> That's an, you know, before you can let them go at 18, I guess. But I, hopefully it's not that going to be always the case. But in my case, it took me five years and three marketing partnerships to be able to launch the first product. And a lot of people discount marketing as being just, ah, laway lang yan. And build game as a bug, tapos get out there, sell it. Dali lang yan. But a lot of people don't realize that this is the most difficult part of the process. And this is where a lot of the technologies die because of not having the right marketing partner. And I had to try three of them <laughs> before I could actually launch nationwide in the United States. Luckily, the ones that we took was able to do a good job and we were able to go to Europe within two years and Three years later, they wanted to buy the whole business. So that's the kind of relationship that you are on the hunt for. But 
just like anything else, after you've done your first round, time to scale up. That's exactly what I'm very excited about the RX box because it has scaled up from 100, now you're 1,000. The full scale is 45,000 if I'm correct. So I'm hoping that it will come. I'm not questioning that it will, it's just when. I hope we'll get there sooner rather than later, maybe three years. So, but that's the kind of iteration that we need to go through. And so uh, clearly it takes time and you also have to have a vision. In my case, I was there all about eliminating the risk of using animal and human materials. So that was my value proposition. And then of course applications. There's a lot of applications in any technology, but I always tell people, focus only on one. In software development lingo, give me your killer apps. So in my technology, there was a handful. We were developing products in all these areas, but the first two are the one that's fully commercialized in the wound care and the neurosurgical. Actually, that took us about eight years to develop. I think I'll show that here. So that's all we're doing, really just combining the chemical processes as well. But the one critical point that I want to make is let the users design the product for you. Be intimately associated with them because they'll be the ones who's going to be adopting it. So in our case, it was the doctors. We lay out our prototypes every time they ask for it, but it is them that eventually will decide what works. Again, just to highlight, this is the value proposition example of what I was replacing human and animal sourced materials, so I had to be able to identify what's the difference with my material. So, and just to even make it more difficult, we are the first company that developed a material for implant, permanent implantation of microbial cellulose, but it took us almost nine years and about $20 million to do it. But unfortunately, we got to the finish line. We had our FDA approval in 2012, and that's why it was a good time to sell the company as well. But I had at least a very patient um, venture capital group that backed me up. But it took that long. So at the end of my 17 years, this is the value. We had seven FDA approved product. We had about, I had 10 US granted patents in my name, about 30 internationally. And I had been able to market the product for both the US and Europe with a CE mark. And it was a nice natural point in time to sell also because again, the venture capitalists that funded you want their money back and then some. So you better be able to give them back with interest plus plus. But what it did was it opened up more opportunities. So to me, it was a good time also. 2012 was a good time for me to take a break and come back here. Although, although I did race car driving for a year after I sold the business. And uh, my father-in-law said, you can only chase so many sunsets with your Porsche. I'll better come back here and help, help the scientists in the Philippines. You may be able to give them a few pointers. And that's exactly what I did. So in my first talks, if you've seen me talk before, there's one word that I always tell people that to remember, if you have a technology, you have to trim it. Tabasa nyo. And trim is address all those particular points. Focus your technology, deal with regulatory, have intellectual property, and yung tatlong M, hindi yung mayaman, madaling mamatay, hindi yun yun. Yung tatlong M nito is manufacturing, marketing, and money. So if you have all these ingredients, then come back and form your business plan. Pero hindi lang pwedeng technology lang. So that's my requirement. Elevate. And uh, usually, if you do calculate your ROI, it's probably science fiction <laughs> in the first time around, but try it anyway and have an impressive number if you can. So as a personal counsel to entrepreneurs that I give, because I do mentor students in enterprise with Louis, I always dare the young ones and the old ones, Dr. Trono, dare them to dream about hopefully commercializing their technologies. Remember, you can't do it all, so form a team. And 
a lot of people are hung up in the Philippines about control. They need, they think they should own 100% or 51% or super majority at 66%. All these kinds of, no, it's an illusion. You're never in control because you don't have the money. If you want to pay for everything, yes, you can be in control. But if you're trying to raise with venture capital and dealing with investors and dealing with the FDA and the funding agencies, you're never in control. You're in control of the technology and the business. But remember, you can try your best even if the venture fails or the business fails, which 9 out of 10, it will. Yan ang stats. Sorry to say it. This is the scary part. Only 9 out of 10 or uh, even worse stats is there was a, a, a Midwest uh, uh, um, enterprise uh, uh, solicitation, 128 business plans, 8 got funded in Chicago. Only two were alive a year later. So that's why we don't have a technology in UP coming out or a successful business because our technology is not that many. We started when Benny was, I, uh, we had about 15, 18, uh, Dr. Pacheco. Yeah? So we tried to move three and we didn't succeed. We got to a certain point, but there was not enough. So we need more. That's what we've been trying to do is to plant more seeds essentially. But even if you fail the first time around, don't worry because Fail, the business may fail, but you as a person, you don't fail. You actually improve. You get better. You get harder. So do it anyway. So I think for those people who have seen me talk, you've seen it to this one. This is the new slide. So at the end of all of this talk, what does it take? Being a race car driver, this is what I came up with. You want to commercialize the technology? Drive. Deliver your promise. If you're going to make early detection, early cure, deliver. Give me your scientific-based proof set. R, reduce my risk if I'm going to adopt it. The more that you have FDA or FPA approval, the better. Because my risk as an investor is less. I, I think President Pascual touched on this one. Innovate. Solve a real problem. Get out there, know what the problems are, and then innovate to solve it. I always ask the professors how often do you meet industry. Industry? Uh, I see them every now and then. But no, get out there. Because only then will you really know what industry needs and wants. And then you go back to your labs and then invent or innovate to be able to solve their problems. Then you get adoption. And of course, V is the value I was talking about all this time. It's a value chain. Every step of the way, every time you wake up in the morning, you ask, how can I make or create value for my technology today? Same way, how am I going to serve my government or serve UP today? And if you're a really good researcher, you can do both. And last but not the least, effort. Hindi pwedeng ningas kogun. It takes time. In my case, it's been 25 years. It's been fun though. And I encourage you to try it sometime. Thank you very much.